empathy for those that are antisocial personality disorder characteristic, yeah. which I thought it was just people that don't like to be in crowded areas. I didn't know it went to the extent of emotions and empathy. Yeah, well, you know, listen, I'm I am not a um, psychotherapist or psychiatrist, but um, from the from the research we did, you know, it it, it goes across a vast range, and um, you know, that was one of our challenges with this character was, of course, how to find that that sweet spot in the character for somebody who's on meds early on early on in the story, um, and and allow an actor to still have some emotion to play. Or, or something to play because of course, you know, acting tends to be portraying emotion. And if we have a character that's, um, you know, that, that is a-emotional, well, how do you do that? And of course that was part of Scott's questions early on when we were uh, working on the script and, and developing the story um, was finding that place for him to play something without, uh, you know, without losing the, the, the volatility of his character, without losing the, um, you know, the psychotic aspect of his character. We didn't want him to just be flat. So that was the hardest part, really. And not only that, but I think mental issues are is becoming a little more talked about, but still some see yeah. it in this case for him being like antisocial, like crazy or a freak. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, of course, uh, when you start to trace through the story and, and you see what his character is like, you know, ultimately he says, um, they were all bad people. And I mean, he, he is a, a person who's on the spectrum. Uh, we know that in the story. Um, but he's a guy who also only reacted to bad people. And, you know, when he was, when he was killing, he was killing just the bad people and um, not, not necessarily uh, a psychotic killer, but, but someone who's, who targets a little bit more. So um, his, his psychosis tends to be, well, his, his, uh, his strength, I guess, is that he is um, lacking in empathy. So therefore, when it comes to taking somebody out that he's been asked to kill, uh, he has no problem with it. At the same time, uh, he doesn't kill the wrong people. So that was, again, a hard, you know, a hard balance to strike in this character. So, yeah, you mentioned the lack of empathy there. But as a director, how was it for you as challenging it was to been to have feel empathy for this character d yeah i mean um as i said you know this is this is something where we had to really uh work with scott a lot scott with us to to find that perfect place where we could portray who he is without um without having to overly emote when he's on the meds early on in the story of course uh he he's supposed to be dulled down all his senses are completely taken away um but at the same time we still wanted him to be dangerous um so we have to learn that through the people around him and through his history and of course through his doctor through his therapist those things were hilarious i mean here you are in the middle of a chaos and yet calling your psychiatrist like asking exactly. questions that was hilarious yeah that was something that i really liked about the story right right from the beginning was uh the fact that you had these little asides where, where he would go to this man who was supposed to be his, um, his, his centering force, who was supposed to be his, his compass north, and yet every piece of advice he gave him was completely off the mark and, um, and got him more and more in trouble. Yes, and he was played by Mel Gibson, which at times I was like, well, does Mel Gibson's character have a shrink too? <laughs> well, I think that that was something we talked about in our first conversation. Um, Mel and I were saying, as a matter of fact, Mel said that to me, and then I, I was, I was about to say it to him, uh, was that I think every therapist has their own therapist, and uh, and uh, so he was like happy to play that. And and in our very first conversation on the phone, he said, "Let me get this straight. This character is a little off center, right?" And I said, "Absolutely, he is." Um, and he said, "Good, good. Now I know how to play this guy." <laughs> and and he, I think he, he did a brilliant job. So where the, did the filming take place for him versus to everyone else? Uh, the filming for Mel took place in Los Angeles. And um, uh, we, we had a very packed shoot schedule with Mel, uh, but he is such a dedicated filmmaker and actor. Um, he refused to leave set. He stayed on set all day long, not, not because he couldn't, but 
but he just wanted to be there. And I think it's kind of his happy place to be on a film set. And uh, he's just such a joy to work with. Um, he was very professional, very collaborative, uh, you know, came with ideas, uh, funny, irreverent, um, you know, and, and just even during the day built on the character a little bit more as we found opportunities. So it, he was he was fantastic to work with. And the rest of the filming took place in British Columbia. The lighthouse, the island, was it the same place where this house was? No. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when I was first showing the script, of course, I was saying to the producers, we should shoot this somewhere in the North Atlantic on an island off of Maine, Nova Scotia, somewhere like that, uh, or maybe the North, uh, Pacific Northwest. Um, and with COVID, uh, of course, things were very tight, of, you know, about how we could move around. And, and um, the producers showed me a few locations the inn particularly, um, and said, look, there's this place. It's in the middle of the mountains. Uh, it's on the edge of a ranch by a lake, but it's, it's certainly not on the ocean. Um, and I said, well, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have to pin this all together, all these, all these various locations. We're gonna have to pin them together with visual effects um, and with clever editing. And that's exactly how we went about it. Um, with COVID, of course, we had to go into these small towns like, like Merritt or, or Kamloops um, or Kelowna, and take over a hotel, stay in that hotel and just go from our hotel to set and back again, uh, and then move on to our next location. And there were four actual locations, the pier, the bunker, um, the inn, um, and then the, where the submarine bunker was, which was a glass factory way down a valley in the middle of nowhere. Um, and then uh, we had to sort of make this all feel like the same place. Um, the thing that really grounded that was the inn. The inn, when I went to look at it, it almost perfectly matched the script, like scene for scene, room for room. It even had this room at the back where the funeral scene is um, that uh, it's described in the script as having a parquet floor and, and this room off the back that, that uh, was used probably for dances or, or social events, but is now being used for this, um, for this funeral. And it was perfect. I mean, it was absolutely ideal. Uh, it was like the writers went to this place Took a took a survey of the of the location and then wrote the script. You mentioned right now the tank. Was yeah. that? Can you talk a little bit about shooting those scenes there? Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, this this was um, we shot in in an old glass factory, an abandoned glass factory, and um, you know we had to build a quarter of our set. Uh, we couldn't we couldn't build the whole set because we just didn't have enough room. So there's a great deal of green screen in there that you don't realize. Um, there is no water in that actual place, except what was coming through the roof because of the bad weather. Um, and uh, this was this was a place that had multi levels and and allowed us to go up and down catwalks and into these dark tunnels. Um, even when they first climbed down into the in, into the um, underground environment, uh, they're actually climbing down the chimney of the former glass factory. And through the tunnel that would have, um, you know, that would have had, uh, you know, probably the discharge of the smoke going out of it, the steam going out of it, uh, when the when the factory was running, and it gave us so many different looks and so many different areas to play with. Uh, but the the key environment was really the catwalks where the guys are shooting with their machine guns down towards the submarine, and um, and that was all practical in one direction and almost completely green screen in the other direction. So it. It was a great location, really. It looked spectacular. Yeah, thanks. And yeah. so this film, the message I feel, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like it also covers the importance of second chance in more than one way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, the thing that I love about it the most is uh, is the fact that it's, it's a man coming to his mother and asking for a second chance. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a prodigal son story, really. And, and the idea that uh, this, this completely psychotic killer comes back to his mother to ask for forgiveness more than anything, because she maybe misunderstood who he was early on. And of course, she, uh, she, by the end of the story, you know, goes to him and says, look, you know, I believe you. I believe that everything that you are and, and were is not as bad as I always thought it was. It wasn't because you were a bad person. It's, it's because you were a person who was reactionary and, um, uh, and dealing with life the best way you knew how. But 
you know, you weren't, you weren't out there just, you know, being a psychotic murderer, a uh, serial killer per se. It was, it was more that you were just trying to survive. Um, and, uh, and in the story, of course, he's, he's there to protect his family and, and, uh, and get back together with family. And um, that, that was the thing that really appealed to me was that it was taken down to the most human level and to the most, uh, you know, one of the most basic relationships that we have is with our mother, right? And not only that, but what a big difference when at least there's one, one or two people that kind of say, I believe in you. Yeah. That support. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you see in the story as each character starts to come around and, um, and say, you know, well, maybe he, you know, maybe he's telling the truth. Maybe he's a good guy. And the first one who recognizes his good qualities, of course, is the boy is, you know, is, is the child who, who with his innocence looks at this guy and says, Hey, you're great, you know. And this man is somebody who, for him, represents his father, who's who's just been killed and just died. And and he looks at this man who he hasn't really known his whole life, um, and and gives him the first good chance. Uh, and I think that's where you know it, he starts to come around, is realizing that that there is a humanity behind those eyes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, as we start to wrap up, uh, is there anything you can share that you're working on or any of your work will be seen? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm working on a couple things. Um, I'm working on a, a horror trilogy um, that we hope to be a series, uh, a series of novels from, from Ireland called Kappa White. It's a horror, uh, horror series. And um, uh, with the same producers, I've, I'm about to go into my third movie with them shooting in the Canary Islands, hopefully this spring. So we're casting that right now. Um, and I've got a few other projects on the go as well. So it's going to be busy. Nice. Well, great. Well, thank you for your time and talking about danger. As yeah. we speak, I also see you have an Acapulco chair back there. I do. Yeah. I, have, I actually have two, but mine are like those colorful ones and I have them as patio chairs. We have we have uh, three or four outside as our as our patio chairs as well. Thank you so much for your time again. You're welcome. Thank you.